welcome to another episode of Bro History. It's Henry Zamoda, Danny Abdeljabar. How's it going, Danny? Doing great, man. How about yourself? I'm doing pretty well. I appreciate you asking. And uh, today, everyone's been asking for us to get some more guests. So uh, we have a guest. And we have uh, on today's show, we have uh, Pratri- uh, Pratik. I'm Pratik Chogali. Pratik <laughs> Chogali. <Jesus. laughs> Sorry about that. Pratik Chogali, who's a researcher and political consultant. He's currently writing a book about American universities in the Middle East and their relation to U.S. foreign policy. And uh, you can find his work on, on publications such as National Interest, which we quote often, and The American Conservative. Uh, Pratik, uh, Pratik, how are you? I'm sorry about that. I'm, I'm just – I've had a long day, and I'm, I'm not <laughs> primed. I, I, I'll make you feel better. I mispronounced Dandy's name for about – Six months. Six to seven months, and I've known Danny for about five years. <laughs> no, not a problem. Thank you for having me on. <laughs> thanks, thanks, for, uh, thanks for joining us today. And you wrote a really interesting piece, and I, I kind of um, saw myself in a lot of what you wrote because, um, you know, one, one of the pieces that you wrote was, um, you know, your, your journey from be- being a, I guess, a self-proclaimed neoconservative into a foreign policy realist and that's kind of similar to where you know I I have been in my life. When I was younger, I was a big, uh, you know, I was a staunch Bush supporter. I was a very big supporter of the Iraq War. And you know, as I got into my twenties, I, I started to change a lot of my my views. And I actually consider myself more as a non-interventionist. And the the term realist, I feel like, is is thrown around a lot. And I'd love to hear, you know, your journey from, you know, being a self-proclaimed neoconservative to a realist. And I guess give, you know, what your definition is of a foreign policy realist. Sure. Well, I think the if there's a common denominator in my worldview uh, that continues to the present day, uh, it's a interest in political tyranny and then specifically an interest in how to eradicate political tyranny. Um, so that's what ultimately got me into neoconservatism. Now, I think for, uh, I was born in 1986, and so growing up through the 90s and watching U.S. military interventions uh, generally working, generally uh, succeeding in uh, stopping humanitarian crises or generally preserving a favorable world order, um, I, I think like many people of that generation had a great deal of confidence uh, in the military instrument to advance human rights and democracy and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, but over time, I, a combination of watching uh, U- recent U.S. military interventions occur, uh, also becoming more educated about uh, alternatives to uh, military action, which I talk about in the article, um, and then also thinking more about the effect uh, at home of uh, on our culture and our economy and just generally the opportunity costs uh, of using military force uh, all of which uh, sort of made me steer away from neoconservatism and uh, move in a more uh, libertarian direction so was there a so for me i i got aligned with a lot more um i guess hawkish foreign policy during the Iraq War, and you know, a big thing was that that was September 11th, which which affected me. Uh, Danny and I are both from New York, and you know, I was very young when September 11th happened, so it had a very <clears throat> profound effect on my on my psychology. Really, I, it was I was in seventh grade during September 11th, and that was really the big thing that kind of pushed me into. I mean, I was a young kid, so it's it's hard to develop any type of nuanced view on foreign policy when you're 12. However, that that stuck with me for the years to come, throughout my teenage years at least, until I got into college. I started to reevaluate how I thought. Now, I'm curious to hear, you know, what was the the big? Where did you get this interest in foreign policy? Like, where, where did that journey start? Um, you know, what what political event set that off for you? So, if you can believe it, um, it was actually when I was very young, at age five, during the first Gulf War, and. Uh, the reason why that was formative is because uh, the the first Gulf War was really the the first conflict that was televised in the way that we think about it, where CNN was had embedded reporters and they were following the campaign uh, as it unfolded. And so my parents were glued to the TV, like a lot of Americans were. Um, and so that intrigued me. And my uh, uncle, who now works in the foreign policy field, he wrote a children's book at the time 
to try to explain the war to uh, kids like me and others who are watching it uh, unfold. He, um, in the children's book, he basically portrayed the conflict as if um, a bully named Iraq was stealing blocks from a child named Kuwait and that America sort of intervened to uh, stop this. Um, so you that's, know, a, I, that's don't yeah. steal my blocks, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You got to tell me where I can get a copy of this because I tried <laughs> to get it on Amazon and it wasn't available. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, no, no, I'll, I have a whole box of them. I'll, I'll get you a copy. Oh, that's awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Um, anyway, but but so I, you know, that that piqued my interest in foreign policy, and um, and even as I developed a more mature uh, understanding of the conflict, I came to really regret the way the war ended. Um, I I thought, and I and even now I I I think that. Had we managed the uh, 91 uprising in the right way, we may have um, prevented a lot of problems that ended up occurring down the line. And then when you think about from, from 91 forward, um, the U.S. military and U.S. interventions, I think, were broadly successful in terms of how we addressed uh, the crises in the Balkans, uh, how we, on economics, promoted globalization and free trade. And, um, and then after 9-11, I, I thought in light of the experience over the last uh, couple of decades that um, we really had a, a moment and an opportunity to uh, bring democracy and human rights to the Middle East, all of which I thought would ultimately redound not only to our own uh, national security interests, but also to the benefit of the people in the region. Um, but uh, obviously things did not turn out in that way. Not exactly, no. Um, but that's a that's a very pragmatic you know approach to it, and I think you know a lot of Americans kind of fell for that trap, um, and and it seems like you know looking in hindsight it kind of was a trap, um, based on the on the pretenses. Um, but uh, you know y- you you talk a lot about um, you know how perhaps it, it didn't pan out the way that it should have you know post nine eleven, um, and I, I was reading your one of your articles uh, on how you. Uh, transition from a neoconservative to a foreign poly re- policy realist, and I just wanted to read a quick um, quote from that, and and maybe get some some additional uh, color for that. Um, so y- you wrote, uh, "Realism is not simply a concession to the world as it is, where religious and ethnic identities retain their stubborn holds, and where human nature resents even the most benevolent efforts to impose societal transformation." In realist insights, I discern the roots of a sustainable strategy, one that could preserve the enlightened ideals of Western civilization, at least as long as it remained mindful of America's historic role as a global stabilizer, as well as the universal, universalistic ethos that often animates its people. Satisfied that realism had compelling moral basis, uh, I concluded that a foreign policy of restraint offers the best hope for nurturing democratic capitalism at home and inspiring those uh, in other countries who, as Irving Kristol counseled, uh, will draw the, on their own political and cultural backgrounds in arriving at a sustainable disposition of this matter. So, I was wondering, could you could you explain what f- what a foreign policy of restraint is, and how does that differ from isolationism, for example? Well, I uh, I think uh, the way the word isolationism is used in our current uh, uh, political discourse, it it's often used as an insult in a way of um, uh, sort of pigeonholing people into certain beliefs. And so I try to avoid uh, that term. Um, But to me, even if you're using it not in a value-laden way, it kind of uh, implies or connotes to me someone who broadly wants to live in a fortress America where um, they want to keep America as a cocoon away from the world. Um, And that's at least emphatically not where I am. I, I very much would like to see an America that's engaged in the world, um, certainly participating in free trade, uh, but also in the exchange of ideas and people. Um, so, so I'm certainly not a an isolationist. Um, I think I think part of the reason I I gravitated toward neoconservatism at the outset was actually in many ways because I found realism, at least in the way that I understood it at the time, to be. Uh, unsatisfying and and unsatisfying for two reasons. I think one, as we talked about, um, I noticed that a lot of realists had a very uh, pessimistic view of what America could uh, achieve in the world, which uh, struck me as being overly pessimistic in light of how enormous the the power imbalance was between the U.S. and the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. But the other was that I found that um, many realists at least struck me 
as being uh, agnostic or indifferent to uh, the role of values. And I thought that this was a strategic misjudgment for two reasons. One, because I think uh, we do, in fact, have something to offer to the world uh, in terms of our values. But two, a big part of our identity as a uh, enlightenment nation um, is very much grounded in values. And if, if this country were to, or its leaders were to try to uh, conduct a foreign policy that did not uh, pay attention to our universal ideals, our liberal democracy, our emphasis on human rights, um, that I think too much of a gap would emerge between the culture and sentiments of the American people and uh, their leaders. Um, but uh, you know, as I as I wrote in that section that you quoted, um, I think looking back, that was a an unfair characterization of realism, and I think realism, at least in the way that I understood it, or I understand it now, uh, can can sort of lead to a foreign policy that cares about human rights, cares about democracy, uh, but does so with the prudence and caution. Um, that we that we need in light of just realities in the world. So I was at this thing at the so I was um, in a a fellowship for the National Review, and you can imagine that it's um, it was like a, a National Review Fellowship Institute. I wasn't actually like a writer or was employed by the National Review, but I was like part of a program that they were running. And um, basically, it was it was the way the way I describe it in a nutshell. It's it's it was a, a group of New York City conservatives um, talking about their feelings and how hard it is to be conservative in New York City. <laughs> but other than that, there was actually a lot of, um, like, you know, interesting lectures that they would have. And during our foreign policy lecture, the way that they described it was that, you know, there's four people, there's four types of people when it comes to foreign policy. There's a strict non-interventionist. There is a neoconservative. So people like, you know, non-interventionists, they would consider someone like Pat Buchanan or Ron Paul. Like those are the people they drew underneath that. Then when it came to neoconservatives, they drew up people, you know, from the Bush administration, like Dick Cheney and, uh, you know, Richard Pearl, guys like that. And then they drew up, um, you know, for, for war hawks, you know, they made a distinction between war hawks and neoconservatives and they, and they iconed um, John Bolton as a war hawk. I frankly don't really know the difference between a neoconservative and a, and a war hawk. I guess it's just, I guess if you're referring to a neoconservative as that specific clique um, that was in the Bush office, maybe I could see your point, or maybe someone who just really believes in like the idea of spreading democracy across the world and you know that ideology of uh, of you know leading at leading in, in front and and uh, you know inspiring people by force. But the way they defined Warhawk was more so just someone who doesn't play around, who enforces, you know, who's very concerned about security and doesn't take any threats, uh, you know, um, lightly. But then he, when it came to realist, um, you know, the guy who was uh, performing the lecture, um, the realist, um, you know, they said, like, you know, someone who's just very pragmatic, you know, they pick and choose their battles. Um, you know, they, they're someone who uh, doesn't jump into doesn't jump into needless conflict, but is not afraid to use force when the time is right or when they have to. So I was wondering what you thought of those definitions. And um, yeah, I'd love to hear what your, you know, what your uh, insight would be to that, if you have anything to add or if you disagree with anything. Well, that, that sounds broadly uh, correct to me. I think that the where I would draw a difference perhaps between a, a war hawk, as you said, and a neoconservative is that I think neoconservatives care uh, very deeply about human rights and democracies and values. Um, it isn't simply a talking point or something. And I think that those differences perhaps uh, show up when we're in the realm of uh, strictly humanitarian endeavors. Um, I, I suspect, I don't know about John Bolton per se, but people in that mold of conservatism, I think, would have uh, serious reservations about intervening in a humanitarian conflict or crises where everyone agrees that we have no uh, direct or ostensible national interests, whereas I think for a, a neoconservative, they perhaps would be more in tune with a liberal internationalist, someone like Samantha Power, where they recognize that we, there is a compelling uh, reason to act uh, morally, if nothing else. Um, I do also find it interesting that the, um, uh, the, as you said, the discussion kind of lumped someone like Pat Buchanan and Ron Paul in the same category. 
Um, I think given the, the moment we're in and given where our political debates are, I suppose um, people of those uh, viewpoints perhaps find themselves in agreement uh, in opposition to much of the status quo. But um, I, would, I would think that at a philosophical level, there is actually quite a bit of a difference between someone whose starting premise is that um, sort of America as a political unit or as a nation state really is paramount versus a, a libertarian who perhaps ultimately would like to see a truly interconnected world with, without borders and free trade and uh, that sort of thing. Um, so you know they, they might come down on the same side of any debate about uh, military force, but, but it seems to me like the end goal here is actually radically different. How does... Um... <clears throat> Just kind of playing along with that, how, how do you think um, foreign policy of restraint or, or you know, uh, realism uh, offers kind of the best hope for nurturing those democratic capitalism uh, at home and abroad? You know, I think my my views actually, since I wrote that article, have uh, evolved a little bit um, in the sense that I think the most people who describe themselves as realists uh, very much believe um, not only as a practical matter, matter, but also as a uh, moral matter. They're, they're very much comfortable with a world order based on uh, coherent nation states and countries pursuing their national interest. Um, and at the time that I wrote that article, I broadly took for granted um, that U.S. foreign policy ought to really be concerned first and foremost with the American national interest, that, that there wasn't anything wrong with it, and that for the foreseeable future, we would really have an America-centric world order that we should tend to. Um, I think since I wrote that article, I've become more open-minded, um, really about moving on to a new type of world order where nation states really begin to dissolve or at least weaken as political entities, and where we see much more globalization and integration, and where we begin to see uh, free trade becoming a reality, where we begin to see nation states perhaps uh, fracture with secessionist movements, um, where we see free trade, free economic zones increasingly becoming free uh, political zones as well. Um, so I'm, I think I'm moving much more in that direction, which probably puts me at odds a little bit with uh, realists. Okay, that sounds to me uh, very much like uh, um, more libertarian values uh, than anything else. Uh, would, would you consider yourself uh, a libertarian? Yeah, I'm certainly moving in that direction. I think that the probably a major realization um, uh, that I've had over the last few years is simply that there are real limits as to what uh, uh, government can achieve. I, um, I very much, I don't know if you recall this, but um, at some point in his uh, administration, I, I don't remember the exact year, we can probably look it up, but Obama gave a long uh, interview to Jeffrey Goldberg of The Atlantic. This was after the Libya intervention um, and in fact, this may even have been where he popularized the term the blob to describe the foreign policy establishment. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, what, what I, if I remember the interview correctly, he basically said, look, I deferred to these um, foreign policy experts on Libya. Uh, we intervened and now look at what happened. And that really struck a chord to me because um, when I, I spent a lot of time looking at the Iraq war, the conception and execution of it, and because it was so obviously mismanaged in so many ways, I held on for a long time to the belief that if only we had gotten certain things right, that the war could have turned out differently. Right. But when you look at the execution of the uh, operation in Libya, it's pretty hard to find a circumstance where military intervention happens as cleanly as that. I mean, we had the whole world united behind us. We had an indigenous uprising. We had a small country with natural resources right near the European continent. I mean, mm -hmm. you have like all the conditions that very rarely align in the real world. Um, you, you also, I would even argue, had a fairly competent um, team in the Obama administration. And yet, I, th I don't think there's a single person today who argues um, that, that Libya today is a, a better, safer uh, place than, than what it was before. And it ha has caused a lot of problems um, for the U.S. ability to act down the line. And so it just sort of occurred to me that if, if military intervention in our government cannot manage even a crisis on that scale, uh, it, we're not really dealing with a implementation or execution problem. We, we really have to fundamentally rethink this uh, emphasis or dependence that we have on the military instrument.
And that's a really interesting point that you bring up, that li- all the stars were aligned for a successful intervention in Libya. But meanwhile, after the intervention, after you get rid of Gaddafi, um, you know, there's al-Qaeda cells everywhere in Libya. And you have things like, uh, you know, open open air slavery. Um, you have a huge micro crisis going into Europe. I mean, that was... From my understanding, that was already taking place, but it, it certainly did not help to have Gaddafi um, removed from power. And it's a really interesting point that even when all the stars are aligned correctly and you think that's an ideal time to you know pounce and, and go through an intervention, it still doesn't work out at the end of the day. Right, right. So I, I'm curious, so... Going to, you know, the other article that you wrote, so um, the pacifist movement is, is dead, or, you know, peace peace is passed, why the pacifist movement died. So Passé, uh, you know, by the I, way, Henry. What's that? You pronounce it passé. Passé? <laughs> oh, well. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> peace is passé, why the pacifist movement died. Um, so I would love to hear, I guess, you know, your diagnosis of... of uh, you know what happened to the pacifist movement because in your article you actually really go through the history from world war one to now so um i hope you you know i know i may be asking you a, a, like a kind of a long task but you know i'd love to would you mind outline the history of you know of the american pacifist movement and what exactly happened to it yeah i mean the the genesis of this article uh, really was that i was watching the democratic candidates debate foreign policy and um there, there is now a, a genuine debate in, in the Democratic Party on foreign policy, and you can you can see the different worldviews. But one of the things that struck me was that many of the Democratic candidates differed on this or that military intervention or or whatever. But I found that even the candidates like Tulsi Gabbard and others who are really fundamentally questioning our foreign policy, it seems to me like none of them were really questioning the use of military power, not only as a matter of pragmatism, but really morally um, thinking about whether a foreign policy grounded in this military instrument uh, and with frequent use of force is inherently um, morally acceptable. And so I began to then think about, well, why is that? How did we get there? Now, you know, when I before I wrote this article, when I when I heard the term pacifism, my mind automatically would go in one of two directions. Either I thought about like the American Quaker movement, for example, or I thought of the uh, the Gandhian tradition, uh, sort of elsewhere in the world. But as I began to do the research for this article, um, I was quite surprised at how uh, prominent the uh, pacifist movement has been throughout the 20th century, how, although I argue it was never by any means a majority or dominant uh, worldview, it was absolutely part of the national debate uh, and the national discourse. Um, and, and it was like that uh, because pacifism enjoyed a great deal of buy-in, not only from grassroots movements, but also by some of the most powerful uh, influential elites in our society. Um, and I, I talk in the article about how beginning from World War I uh, through the Vietnam War, uh, pacifism had a great deal of uh, an impact on our national discourse. But then after hitting a high point in the Vietnam War, uh, it, it basically faded away and now is basically a non-factor in our uh, foreign policy debates. So what do you think happened? So here's something, and I'm going to throw this at you. So um Looking back at the Iraq war, when there was all these large protests um, from the left, from the American left towards the Bush administration. But meanwhile, you know, you see later, you know, there's still intervention taking place. You know, the Obama administration is, is hawkish on Libya, as we discussed, and, you know, they're hawkish on Syria as well. So it can leave someone to come with the diagnosis that, the, the left, the American left, was never really anti-war or non-interventionist. They were just anti-Bush. They were anti-Republican, and that's why they protested the war. And I think it's fair to say, you know, not everyone, of course, but I think it's fair to say that maybe if it was a Democrat in office, that they would have been a lot more content with, with uh, you know, the Iraq war and, you know, Afghanistan and Iraq and everything that happened after 9-11. So love to hear, you know, what your thoughts on that are. 
Yeah, I remember, I, you know, I guess you, you raise a good point, because when you look at the run up to the Iraq war, there were, uh, in fact, mass uh, anti-war protests both here and in Europe. Um, but they never, for a variety of reasons, translated into uh, any sort of real initiative or, or reflection among the American Congress. Now, I remember at the time, uh, in the run-up to the Iraq War, um, when, when prominent Democrats would get behind the war, I always thought that maybe it was, there was a degree of cynicism, maybe they just didn't want to be caught on the wrong side of an American uh, military intervention, as many on the left were after the first Gulf War. Um, but I think in retrospect, as, I, as we look back at it, um, when you look at the vote in Congress uh, to authorize the use of force in Iraq, it was overwhelming. It was a genuine bipartisan uh, endorsement of, of war. Um, and, and I think actually there's reason to believe that um, this was not simply a cynical vote uh, by the Democratic Party, that it actually did re reflect broadly where uh, at least the elites of the Democratic Party are. And I, I would argue that for a couple of reasons. I think one point to think about is that if you look at the 2000 election, um, you, you have to consider the fact that Gore got more votes uh, than Bush did. And if you look at the platform that he ran on, he was actually arguing, uh, uh, I would argue, for a uh, not only an even more aggressive foreign policy, but also one backed by uh, if I recall correctly, he was actually campaigning on expanding uh, the defense budget even more than the Bush administration was. And so I think there's real reason to believe that had 9-11 happened on the watch of a Gore-Lieberman administration, we may very well have gotten the same outcome. Um, but even after, when you look at uh, 2004, 2008, when you look at how the Democratic primaries evolved, um, it took until 2008, first of all, for a uh, significant portion of the Democratic Party to gravitate toward a candidate uh, in Obama who seemed to even somewhat question the um, uh, prevailing orthodoxy of foreign policy. But even Obama was always very clear that although he had opposed the Iraq war, it was not because he had any principled objection to the use of military force or even to this idea of American global leadership. He simply objected to the, uh, uh, quote, dumb war. And, um, and so he, you know, Obama very much consolidated uh, the support for this uh, kind of foreign policy that we had under Bush and under Clinton and under George H.W. Bush. And there was a much greater degree of continuity under Obama than there was any difference from what we had before. Yeah, that's 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 an interesting point, and I'd like to I'd like to color this a little bit. So, so um, Pratik, I'm not sure that you know this, but you know Henry happens to fall on the kind of the right side of politics, uh, where I kind of fall on the left. And some of the beauty of our show is that you know oftentimes we disagree, and and this is one point where I'd like to disagree with Henry on the characterization uh, that the anti-war sentiment from the left during the Iraq War was just simply an anti-Bush movement. Now. Yeah, admittedly, I don't think that's entirely true. I think that I think that there's some elements of it. I think there's some elements of. I think that. Go on and make your point, and then I'll respond <laughs> to it. Cool. Uh, I mean, I think I'm you know. Obviously, we're, we're all you know the, the three of us were all pretty young at the time that that this war kicked off. You know, um, so I'm not I'm not super in the know about you know the motivations of the the broad American people for you know whether or not they had any true pacifist inclinations uh, in opposition to the war. That's something that I think someone else <laughs> with much more uh, research on the topic would have to kind of discuss. But, you know, one thing that we, we have been talking about is is kind of the political elite class, you know, the, the, the folks, you know, in the House and the Senate, you know, our, our leaders, uh, Al Gore, you know, and, and to a certain extent at this point, you know, we also touched on Obama. But, uh, you know, if, if I read your article correctly, you know, part of the pacifist movement is grassroots, you know, like a big part of it. And it's more than just the elites. It's also, you know, a, a, like a like a broad spectrum of people that are getting behind these causes. Now, obviously, to your point, you know, big uh, uh, big leaders in in parties and, and politics and, 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 you know, people with influence and sway were on board with these pacifist movements as well. So that definitely helped it. But, you know, I, I question, uh, the, you know, the, the, the characterization that, you know, this was strictly an anti-Bush movement. And, 
uh, and this is especially true for someone like myself who, you know, after the war was initiated, I was much too young to form, you know, uh, like a good opinion about it. Uh, at the time, I trusted uh, the characterization that, you know, Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction and therefore, you know, that was grounds enough to, you know, to act and to intervene. Nevertheless, when, when we come to find out in the years uh, following that, uh, in fact, you know, there's not there's not that much uh, uh, substance to those claims, uh, you know, it, it really became you know, clear to me that, you know, that this intervention was wrong uh, and that I was genuinely opposed to it, um, both on the grounds that I found it immoral, I found it, you know, crazy, all the people that, you know, that were dying but on both sides, but frankly, you know, the majority of, of the Iraqi and, and Afghani citizens that, you know, were, were being absolutely demolished, um, but also uh, on a, you know, from a pragmatic, practical response, right? It's extremely expensive, you know, uh, you know, that my, my trust in the political system was, was waning. And, you know, I, I wonder, you know, you talk about this, this uh, uh, pacifist movement, and I wonder if, you know, uh, if maybe we're, we're mi you're missing out on, on, on that, that color. Do, do you think that, that truly peace and pacifism as a, you know, um, is passe? Do you, do you believe that, that, that there weren't elements of, of uh, pacifism, you know, here in the United States during those conflicts or t till today for that matter? Well, it's a good question. Um, I guess I, I'd be curious if you agree or if, I, if you think I'm reading this correctly, but as I went back and did the research, one of the things that struck me was that every time the U.S. mobilized toward war, there would be a, a domestic debate on the war. Uh, the U.S. would get in. Um, and then when the, when the conflict turned out to be costlier than people thought, or for whatever reason people came to regret the decision to get in, as part of the, uh, the, the backlash or the questioning of the conflict, you had all sorts of people coming to question it. But among that debate, um, you would have a significant contingent of people who were espousing explicitly pacifist views. So um, I, I mentioned in the article after World War I, you had thousands of people joining pacifist groups, and they made enough of an impact that uh, Jane Addams won a Nobel Peace Prize. Um, World War II, which we now think about as being this decisive allied victory, one that was strategically and morally justified, even at that time you had a backlash from conscientious objectors uh, who identified and organized as radical pacifists. Um, and again, due to their uh, relief efforts and whatnot, uh, won a Nobel Peace Prize. Korean War, again, you had a, a, a grassroots and elite movement of people who were espousing pacifist views. And then, of course, all of this peaks in Vietnam. Um, now, th the question that I struggled with, and I, I still don't have exactly a clear answer, is that um, in both now Afghanistan and Iraq, you had a, uh, a military intervention with broad-based support that, by any reasonable standard, proved to be far costlier uh, than uh, what, what I think anyone uh, had in mind when we went in. And you've certainly now, I think, reached, we've now reached a national consensus where I think most people have recognized that the Iraq war was probably not the right decision. And now there are serious questions even about Afghanistan. And yet that insight and that recognition that we haven't uh, uh, achieved what we wanted to in Iraq, we haven't seen uh, uh, the blowback to it uh, really expound on uh, pacifist views in the way that we have had uh, after past military interventions that didn't go the right way. And uh, hold on one moment. So let's just take Hold on one moment. Let's just take a quick moment to talk about sex, good sex. Now you can increase your performance and get that extra confidence in bed. Listen up. BlueChew.com. That's blue like the color blue. BlueChew brings you the first chewable with the same FDA-approved active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, so you know they work. You take them anytime, day or night, even on a full stomach, and since they're chewable, they work up to twice as fast as a pill. So you'd be ready whenever that opportunity arises. Now, if you could benefit from extra function and more confidence where it counts, Blue Chew is the fast and easy way to enhance your performance. Most guys talk a good game, but Blue Chew helps you follow through. Blue Chew is prescribed online and shipped straight to your door in a discreet package. So no in-person doctor visits and no waiting on the pharmacy. And best of all, no more awkwardness. Um, 
right now we got a special deal for our listeners uh visit bluechew.com and get your first shipment free uh when you use our special promo code bro that's b-r-o just pay five dollars shipping again that's b-l-u-e chew.com promo code bro to try free Blue Chew is the better, cheaper, faster choice, and we thank them for sponsoring this podcast. And oh yeah, they're also made in the USA, and uh, they're cheaper than a pharmacy, so don't forget it. Um, thank you, Blue Chew. Thanks, Blue Chew. Um, sorry about that. So I guess I would love to just kind of get like you know where your syn- synopsis real quick, and, and just to follow up on what you were saying before, like where, like where do you think what do you think happened to the pacifist movement in the U.S.? Do you think it like ever? you know it was it never really existed at all or was it something that you know could have been just a response to you know domestic politics or or just certain events well i think in in many ways the decline of the pacifist movement is a uh, a testament to the decisions that american foreign policy leaders made uh, after the vietnam war um, where they reoriented our defense strategy to um basically prevent uh, something like a pacifist movement from ever really coming to the fore again. Um, so one of the things that they did, of course, was get rid of the national draft um, and, and create an all-volunteer army, which um, put the onus or the burden of the war on a, a small cross-section of Americans uh, who, are widely, who are generally outside of our uh, country's elite. Um, the other thing they did was that as the defense budget grew, it uh, very much became a component of the American social safety net. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Uh, a, a wide cross-section of Americans uh, basically <clears throat> found employment either directly or indirectly in the defense industry. And importantly, many of the uh, projects or systems that they were uh, working on uh, actually had really nothing to do with uh, our ongoing military conflict. So it, it removed much of that moral dilemma or consideration. Um, and then the final thing is that, um, as I, I, I talk in some detail in the article, a uh, big part of the reason why the, the pacifist movement, uh, particularly during Vietnam, was able to gain traction is because uh, leaders of the pacifist movement aligned with um, the civil rights movement and others uh, who were agitating in American society to uh, resist various uh, injustices in American society, which made it easier to sort of draw the link between problems on the home front with uh, a problematic war abroad. Whereas since the Vietnam War, even though there obviously have been various points of friction in American society, uh, broadly speaking, uh, domestic discontent, insofar as it exists at all, has never reached the boiling point uh, that that provided an opening for a uh, uh, a, a really radical uh, questioning of our foreign policy as well. And that's a great point because I think that most Americans now, D- Danny and I and, and you and, and, and most people who are following foreign policy, uh, who are geeks about this stuff, you know, we're, we're definitely the minority. Um, most of the people I interact with on a day to day basis, they don't really have a strong opinion on foreign policy. Um, you know, really it's, it's they're, they're, you know they don't like mindless war, but you know their their uh, perception on the U.S. military is usually very idolized. Um, it's usually very glorified, and uh, I'm not saying that the U.S. military doesn't deserve respect because I because I think they do, but most people just don't have strong opinions or really care about foreign policy. No one's really cared about foreign policies since the Iraq War, and and I would even say that probably the beginning stages of the Iraq War, no one really, the average American didn't really care about it, unless you could point to you know another time that people really were following you know U.S. escapades and places like the Middle East. Yeah, no, it's a good point. I mean, I I would argue that in two thousand eight, um, at least in the Democratic primary, the Obama Hillary contest to some degree was a, um, I, I, I was, I, I mean, I'll put it a different way that uh, had Iraq not gone as badly as it did, I think that it would have been much harder for a candidate like Obama to wage a serious challenge to uh, Hillary Clinton. So I think that the Democrats had so much of a, somewhat of a debate on foreign policy. But um, I remember I, I talked to a lot of uh, friends and colleagues who were involved with. Uh, the Romney campaign in 2012, and they basically made a uh, 
uh, strategic decision not to really engage on foreign policy uh, for the simple reason that they really had nothing fundamental to disagree with uh, with the Obama administration. And so it, it really kind of created a broad-based uh, national consensus behind foreign policy. And, um, and, and even now going into the 2016 campaign, um, as I talk about in the article, the range of difference on foreign policy within the Democratic Party uh, is, but from a historical standard, all not all that significant. And um, I, I, my prediction here could be completely wrong. But whoever the Republican and Democratic nominees are, uh, I would be surprised if 2020 is a is an election fundamentally about national security or foreign policy. I think the big questions are going to be uh, primarily to do with uh, domestic policy, namely. Uh, the economy, and then also a variety of culture war issues. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up uh, the economy because I wanted to to pick a little bit on on um, something that you had mentioned. You know, I, I want to get your take on what the relationship, uh, you know, between the decline of that pacifist military culture and the military industrial complex is. I want to talk more about that because that that's something <laughs> topic of interest for myself actually. Yeah, no, I mean, I would make a couple of points here. I think the um, to the point about Americans not being interested in foreign policy, I think one of the byproducts of that is when foreign policy is not really resonating uh, as an issue uh, among the American people writ large, that creates an opening for elites uh, to have an outsized role in our foreign policy decisions. And I think that one of the consequences of having a large, uh, as you say, a military industrial complex is that uh, many of the elites who end up having an outsized role in foreign policy come broadly from this uh, uh, defense industrial complex, wh whether they're current or former military officials, uh, whether they're think tank people who get funding from a variety of defense oriented mm -hmm. uh, things, or just simply academics and others who decide that they want a career in foreign policy and they end up going through uh, a series of you know, educational experiences, internships, uh, whatnot, all of which are, are with people whose views are much more hawkish and comfortable with military intervention than the American mm -hmm. people. So I think that that's certainly one uh, cost of, of the military, or not cost, but one uh, consequence, at least, of the uh, military-industrial complex. And then I would say the other one is simply that um, so much of our economy, uh, so much of our mm -hmm. domestic home front is oriented around the military and defense industry that at a certain point it becomes hard even to fathom that there could be an alternative. And I think one mm -hmm. of the, the tragedies of, of our foreign policy today that I, I think we don't talk about enough is um, just how profoundly different our country could be if so much of our economy wasn't oriented around um, investing in the latest uh, weapon system. I mean, imagine That's... if all the intelligent people in our country were thinking about uh, science or innovation or economics rather than defense programs. I think we'd I, have a totally I different. I can't agree with you more, Pratik. That's, that's, that's awesome. And uh, in, in that respect, I'd like to talk about this hot button topic while we're talking about, you know, the military industrial complex, and that's the F-35 program. And, you know, as you point out aptly, you know, uh, a Many, many jobs are created from the military industrial complex, and, and it makes it quite difficult, you know, to oppose, you know, uh, military expansion and, and investments in, in our uh, technical capabilities. Now, I'll preface this all by saying I still think it's imp important for us to be able to, you know, lead in terms of our military capability, but I'd argue that we should do so in a, in a you know, uh, um, in, in a much more dynamic way that doesn't necessarily, you know, uh, <laughs> costs as much as it do. And so the F-35 being the shining example of this, you know, as you as you probably already know, uh, the production of the F-35 is set up in 43 states and nine different countries. You know, we're talking about the most expensive military program ever. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it comes down to a point where, you know, no senator, no House member wants to vote to you know, kind of kill this program because they'd also be simultaneously voting to, you know, uh, cut jobs from their own uh, districts and their own states. Um, so I wanted to get your take on um, on the F-35 program. And, and, and Danielle, I have one more thing to that. Bernie Sanders voted for the F-35 yes, program. Yes, he did. He, he was like, a yeah, supporter. I don't, don't want to lose jobs. You know, we, we, yeah, we, make, exactly. we make airplane parts. I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it right here in Vermont. No more corporate welfare <laughs> except for jobs in Vermont. 
Yeah, I mean, the thing that was doubly striking about Bernie Sanders' support for the F-35, we'll have to look up the exact quote, but I think he said something to the effect that the Vermont National Guard wouldn't have enough to do uh, in the absence of F-35 um, programs, which, which, which to me is a, a, a an argument for getting rid of the F-35. But <laughs> yeah. Um, Anyway, no, I mean, look, uh, like the, the F-35 has long been a, a poster child for uh, cronyism and defense waste and, mm -hmm. and the things you mentioned. I was, um, uh, both in this article and another one I did recently, um, I, one of the things, I, I found it quite striking as I looked into the details of the F-35, that the, um, it, it's not only a matter of uh, pork barrel spending or defense cronyism at home, but it has very real... Uh, consequences for our foreign policy. Um, the two areas that I d delved into in my recent articles, one of them is the fact that the d during this period when we were really struggling with the conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq, the F-35, which were pouring just millions of dollars into, did not conduct a single airstrike yeah. in Afghanistan until yeah. 2018, and then Iraq even, uh, I think, just this year. Uh, if it flew a mission for the first time, and, and that right. too in a way that probably was not uh, entirely appropriate. Um, uh, Tom Cotton uh, said, you know, raised the question, why are we using this fifth generation fighter to strike, uh, quote, as he said, a bunch of terrorists hiding in, in the bushes. Right. Um, but the other component of this, which I think is probably actually even more uh, uh, significant, is the fact that because we're producing and making these F-35s for domestic political reasons, they now have to go somewhere. And it's quite striking the extent to which the F-35 and F-35 sales are a feature of our of the way we conduct relations with our closest allies, yeah. uh, where we mm -hmm. basically you know, all but bully our allies into making these purchases that they don't need. Um, it's not good for either side, and then it creates a whole host of negative externalities for the way our allies think about it. Got to sell that product, defense. Pratik, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's interesting because um, back in, I believe it was May, um, Japan purchased, what, 106 of them? Um, I forget the exact number, um, but they did purchase a lot. And, you know, we're talking about something that's... Um, Danny, what's the unit number on an F thirty five? Like uh, a quarter it's million forever. dollars? <laughs> it's a been quarter, forever. A quarter, since... a quarter billion dollars or yeah, something it's, like it's, that. It's too much. I mean, I know the um, helmet itself well, is like you know hundred grand or something like that. It's I think ridiculous. it's something around one hundred eighty million dollars or so per unit. But you know, I always thought that the reason why that it, it's been it's been used to balance out trade deficits with with you know our our allies, so like Japan. Um, it seemed to me like they were they were striking out some type of trade balance, and that's why they were forced to purchase the F thirty five. Yeah, I mean, I, I focused uh, specifically on U S South Korea relations, and just recently, South Korea made this uh, massive six point eight billion dollar F thirty five sale, which is the largest in uh, South Korean uh, history, and. Um, again, you know, if, if, if the consequences were only limited to buying off certain influential domestic constituencies, that would be one thing. But uh, as I argue in the article now, when you make a purchase like this, this is going to reorient uh, your entire strategy and thinking about your own defense. And I think when the South Koreans are dealing with a, a serious threat and a problem like North Korea, which is, uh, in my view, a genuine foreign policy crisis, um, Looking at the North Korean challenge uh, through the lens or the, the prism of an F-35 and its capabilities, I think is going to distort South Korean thinking uh, in a very profound way and make it harder rather than easier to um, reach a, a good conclusion with the North Korea crisis. Right. I mean, defensively, you know, the, the biggest advantage that the North Koreans have isn't like a nuclear program, but it's their artillery units uh, that they have stationed in the mountains just north of uh, South Korea. And uh, I can't imagine that a squadron of, you know, uh, F-35s could, you know, do very much uh, to that effect. I mean, some of, the, some of the things that we've read and reported on, um, you know, have said that, you know, within hours they could absolutely demolish Seoul, you know. Uh, and that's that's a capability that, that, you know, begs the question, you know, is this the correct tool for the, you know, for the South Koreans, and you raise a really good point, I think, of of saying that okay, now they've invested so much money in in these very high tech, um, you know, uh, fighters, uh, but you know they you know, have to use them. They can just 
have them sit there and, and collect dust, you know? <laughs> uh, so that's a really good point. Yeah, and, and, I, and I'm curious to hear, and I know Danny wanted to, uh, I don't want to steal your, your question that you had planned for him, <laughs> but I, I did want to kind of segue into, um, you know, your, I guess your your history working with, with some d- different uh, pl- administrations. Now, you did you work directly with Bush? Um, with, I think I saw in a bio that you were a Bush appointee. Yeah, I was at the State Department during the final year from 2008 to 2009. I was working uh, in, for the Undersecretary for Arms Control and International Security, who at the time was uh, John Rood. And uh, Rood is now actually the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy right now. And how did you how well first of all how was working how was working for the Bush administration like I'd just love to hear some feedback on that experience. Yeah, um, at the time our actually it, it was quite interesting because the um, the undersecretary uh, bureau uh, that I was working in at the State Department prior to my boss John Rood ha- ha- uh, having that position, um, it was actually John Bolton who had that position before he went to the UN. And, um, and at the time, Bolton was the hawk in the State Department, and increasingly he wasn't on the same page as uh, then Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. Um, so a lot of the big arms control issues that ordinarily would have been handled by that office uh, had been uh, sort of moved out of there uh, and given to others, uh, namely Iran and North Korea. So by the time that I was in that bureau, um, the, some of the big issues we were working on were the um, the missile defense systems in Poland and the Czech Republic. Um, we were also thinking about uh, U.S.-Russia arms control issues, which took an interesting turn when the uh, uh, Russian invasion of Georgia happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we were also thinking through, uh, and I spent a lot of time on this, uh, thinking through the threat of, um, of nuclear terrorism. And I, I spent a lot of time looking into how probable it was, where it would come from, uh, et cetera. Um, so the issues were, those were some of the big issues. And then um, it was also my first introduction to just learning about how, uh, how foreign policy actually is made uh, in government, which was its own education. So, so compare it, so compare it now, I, I think you worked with, with Trump as well. Did he work in the Trump, just on the Trump campaign or did he work in his, uh, his office as well? No, I, I was a, I was the a policy coordinator on the campaign for a couple of months. Um, and I ended up resigning from the campaign. Um, right. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm curious about that. So I, I, I did, um, while I was reading your, uh, post, you linked to a, uh, LinkedIn, um, post, uh, I'm assuming that you wrote just, just after, um, you had resigned. And uh, it, if, if you don't mind me quoting you, uh, under no circumstances, you, you write, uh, will I uh, support Donald Trump for president? I regret my decision last April to join the campaign as policy coordinator. Although I left the campaign in August for a variety of reasons, I wish that I had done so sooner and spoken out more forcefully against a candidate who embodies the worst excesses of our culture. I'm curious about that. Like what, what happened? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've thought a lot about this, and it I suppose it actually ties back to our earlier point about the consequences of, um, of a national security state and, and so forth, where it's easy to get caught up in these situations for pragmatic or opportunistic reasons, and then before you know it, you're in a situation you don't like. Um, I mean, I was, so prior to joining the Trump campaign, I was the uh, policy coordinator on the Huckabee campaign. Right. Um, and uh, because Trump and Huckabee had gotten to know each other and became friendly, um, as uh, Trump was moving toward securing the, the nomination, he had, um, to a remarkable degree, really, you know, all but won the Republican nomination, uh, essentially by himself in a small group of people. So as he realized that he needed to uh, bring, you know, actually have a genuine team in place, he began to borrow from some of the other campaigns, Huckabee included. So um, at the time that I was invited to join the campaign, and I, I this wasn't a position that I had pursued, um, unlike some of the other things I, I've done, um, a colleague of mine asked if I would join the campaign. Um, I mean, I would say of the 16 or whatever, 17 Republican candidates uh, who were running that year, 
Trump was probably uh, my my least favorite. Um, I I, th I would even even at the time I would have been happier with anyone else. But I wasn't a, a never Trumper. That I, I I did think that there was some promise in his candidacy. I thought that he deserved a, a fair chance, given that the party was gravitating to or, toward him. And I thought that, particularly as it dawned on him that this presidential campaign was more than a PR stunt, that he he now actually would be one of the two major party nominees. That he would. Uh, mature and begin to conduct himself like a, a prospective president. Um, to me, there were there were two big turning points, and when I was working for Trump, the first was uh, when I uh, the when I compared and contrasted the Republican and Democratic national conventions, and I saw the uh, speech that Trump gave at the Republican convention, which uh, I found to be quite embarrassing and alarming. I remember I called. A friend of mine, after Trump gave a speech, and I said, "You know, the sky sounds straight out of a sounds like a Latin American tin pot dictator." I mean, that was like the, <laughs> the feel of it. And then when you contrasted that to the way Hillary Clinton conducted herself, I mean, she's much more liberal than I am. But you know, whatever you think of her, I thought that she was eminently qualified and and up to the job, and not fundamentally taking issues with our norms and, and whatnot. Um, so, so that's when I resigned from the campaign. But when I decided to speak out against him, it was really uh, after the, um, the Billy Bush tape. And, and to me, I mean, that was just, you know, it, it, it certainly wasn't the first time Trump had crossed the line with, with poor behavior and whatnot. But, but to me, that was just like a final straw where it was clear that this guy wasn't at least in my mind, that he wasn't uh, morally fit for the job of, of the presidency. That's super interesting. So what, what's your take on the split between John Bolton and Trump? Like, what do you think? Ha well, first, how would you judge Trump so far with your with your new transition from, you know, becoming more of a foreign policy realist? Like, how has Trump done so far? Well, you know, this is, uh, I, I'm going to say this uh, grudgingly, but, you know, I think one of the realities that, that's hard for uh, people like me or, or people who are critics of the Trump administration is that as problematic and disturbing as his personal conduct is, I think if you're looking strictly on a policy basis at the uh, at the Trump administration, although they haven't accomplished all that much, I think I think one would have to concede that they also have avoided many of the blunders um, of their predecessors. I mean, say what you want about Trump, but we haven't seen uh, on the domestic front the kind of, in my view, misguided overhaul of our health care the way we saw under Obama. Um, we certainly have not had the kind of foreign policy blunders that we saw under George W. Bush. Um, so in that, in that sense, I think the Trump administration deserves uh, uh, some credit for, uh, for their caution and their prudence and policy, even, even as Trump continues to behave in this rec reckless way personally. Um, but I do think that the, the consequences of Trump's behavior and, and the way that he has transformed the Republican Party and really made populism a serious coherent force in our politics, um, even if he is impeached and removed from office, uh, th th there's a cost in, on our institutions and our political norms and our civility that is going to be very hard to undo, I, I think, regardless of how this turns out. It's an interesting take. And I wonder if we can if we can take a look specifically at, um, you know, some foreign policy moves that Trump has made recently. Uh, and well, let's, outline, let's outline let's outline the, the, the last couple, you know, his big staple moves that he's made. Um, the first thing I think of is the JCPOA. He moved out of it. Right. I, he, he, he pulled out of it. And it seems like a lot of what he's dealing with now are consequences of him pulling out of the JCPOA. So. Um, you know, that whole debacle with Iran when uh, Iran, Iran shot down a drone and just, you know, basically the whole saga, which con which continues, which is not over yet by any means of, you know, the, the turmoil in the Strait of Hormuz. Um, I'll give credit to Trump when credit credits do um, that he showed restraint and not pulling the trigger and, you know, essentially starting you know either a minor or major military conflict who knows how big the conflict would have been if he did this i tend to think it would have been, been probably huge. more serious would've it would have been, been huge. huge but the fact that he didn't do it you got to give him credit like to me i was like all right well he deserves credit for not actually doing it and then the other things that he deserves credit on uh, north korea uh, you know at least trying to make 
some type of bond with them. But, you know, when I give him credit, it's it's still kind of reluctantly because a lot of the things that he's dealing with is the consequences of him pulling out of the JCPOA. So I'd love to hear your take on, you know, Trump's bit major move of pulling out of the Iran deal. And uh, I guess everything that's happened after that, you know, it, you know, what, 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 what was what what happened there? I guess. Well, look, I would I would chide uh, Trump's policy on Iran for the same reason I would criticize um, the Iran policy of his last uh, couple of predecessors, which has simply been that we've had a general failure of imagination. Now, I think the um, the. The, the biggest problem, in my view, with our Iran policy is the fact that we haven't come to terms with the fact that our problem with Iran is not a nuclear problem. It's not a terrorism problem. It's really the fact that we have uh, in Iran an odious regime uh, in power. Uh, we don't know the extent to which it enjoys uh, the support of its own people, but I think that there are serious reasons to question um, how stable it is in light of uh, the tumult in Iran. So I, I would like to see a, an Iran policy that recognizes that we have a strategic interest in the Iranian regime falling, but falling in a way that is nonviolent and comes from a, an indigenous uh, grassroots movement. And I would say that we've had, um, I, I would criticize the, the, the Trump administration just like I would uh, Obama and the Bush administration for not doing enough to uh, empower the Iranian people. Um, and I think one component of how to do this would be to uh, uh, lift or, or question many of the sanctions that we have in place on Iran, because my concern with tough sanctions on Iran is that we're going to fall into the same trap as we did in Iraq, where we resorted to sanctions and in doing so crippled and decimated uh, the, the middle class in Iraq, which proved to be very problematic for after the regime fell and there was no civil society there left to really rebuild the country. Um, so, you know, I think whatever the merits were of his decision to stay or leave uh, uh, the Iran uh, deal, the point, and my, the big point in my mind is that it happened um, uh, in a larger context in which we weren't thinking the right way about the Iran challenge. Isn't isn't putting on crippling sanctions like we did Iraq, which we continue to do with Iran, isn't that an isolationist policy in itself? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, look, if, if we want to have very narrow uh, sanctions geared toward you know, cutting off the international bank accounts of this or that uh, Iranian elite, fine. But when we're, we're fundamentally just cutting off the Iranian economy and the Iranian people uh, from the world, if we're basically stigmatizing uh, the ability to do business with Iran and in doing so creating all kinds of incentives for black markets and corruption, um, it, it, it doesn't make sense to me on a number of levels. And, and more than anything, it makes you question why our leaders are so afraid of the prospect of American goods and services going into Iran. To me, that, that seems like an opportunity rather than a, a problem. And then when there's videos of like Brian Hook saying, you know, he had that video out of the Iranian embassy or the old Iranian embassy, you know, saying how it's kept up with its old Persian rugs and whatnot. Like, does that type of behavior, and, and he's calling for the Iranian people to rise up and basically overthrow the government, does that type of behavior, does that alienate us from the actual population that would facilitate any type of real change there? Yeah, and you know, the other thing that I concerns me about comments like that is that it, it betrays and reveals uh, what I think is fundamentally a, a lack of empathy and a lack of compassion that ought to guide any foreign policy move that we we make, um, I think there's a tendency in our foreign policy to view sanctions as the kind of default thing that you do when you don't really know how to deal with a foreign policy problem. But when you think about the effect that it has for the people in these countries themselves, um, it's the difference between an Iranian family who has no culpability with what's happening in their country going from a uh, a level of sustenance and, and the middle class to being genuinely poor. Um, and, and I think it's hard to really calculate uh, the human cost of these sanctions, but the point is that I, don't, I, I think it's fair to say that the average American policymaker is not giving that consideration um, it, its due. And I think that, again, it betrays just a lack of uh, compassion and an understanding that our uh, decisions that we make here in Washington 
um, have have real, literally life or death consequences for people in other countries. I think a lot of I think a lot of policymakers they they just assume that the sanctions are harming like the government and you know the whoever the elites are. But I think they I think you raise an excellent point that they fail to consider the 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 hardships they place on on the average civilian like just think about the iraq you know i always think about the iraq sanctions and how many people died how many children died just through lack of medical supplies and and things like that and it's tragic and a lot of people in washington are just not looking at that that they're not looking at that and how that could not only not only is that morally not right but it also is counterproductive because it makes it potentially makes the civilian population align with the hardliners and it alienates us from the people who we would want to have natural change yeah and i would you know i would just add here and i i think this goes back to our earlier discussion about my evolution from realism that you know it, it's easy to say that well our our policymakers ought to have more compassion fine but i think the question we have to ask is why is it okay? Uh, why do the American people believe it's okay? Why do our leaders believe it's okay to uh, impose policies like sanctions or, or whatnot without all that much regard for the consequences of people in other countries? And I think that the answer, at least to me, I, I would be interested in, in your view, but my, my view on it is because we operate in a political universe where we take for granted uh, certain uh, nationalistic uh, assumptions. We basically take for granted that our policymakers ought to be prizing or prioritizing the interests of uh, the American people, uh, even and and to do so in a way that is zero sum. But if we, I, I'm hard pressed to see how we can get out of that mentality without fundamentally questioning the uh, morality of a uh, of an order, a world order that's grounded around nation states, where where we have these sort of units where where politicians come to power believing that no matter how much power they have, military or economic or whatnot, that it's okay for them to make policy decisions on the basis of a couple million people and their arbitrary political entity without thinking about people in other countries as if they were their own responsibility. And I think until we begin to see national sovereignty weakening, uh, markets being integrated, and, and a broader awareness that other people around the world are entitled to the same rights and prerogatives as we are, I think it's going to be very hard to get out of these uh, uh, traps that we set with our sanctions policy. You know, I, I totally agree with you on that, um, at, at least on the part uh, where where you uh, level some criticisms against the human cost of sanctions. And I'd add uh, one piece of color to this that I think might help, uh, you know, at least the U.S., um, you know, the, the American citizens understand its impacts. And that's, uh, you know, I think that a lot of the criticisms that you can levy against um, uh, against sanctions, uh, is similar argumentation can be made against tariffs. Uh, and the convenient thing about tariffs is that uh, we feel the impact. Uh, the United States citizens feel the impact. And so, you know, if we turn our eye uh, just uh, uh, quickly to, you know, another example with uh, China and the way that we are engaging in a trade war with China, you know, our our instincts, um, you know, in, in these trade wars uh, are very much like our instincts, you know, uh, in, in more aggressive uh, uh, tactics like against Iran in that, uh, a tariff is like that default uh, thing that you do when you don't really understand or not creative enough to think of something that would work uh, to come to a mutual agreement, uh, you know, with trade deficits, for example. And so, you know, uh, we see Trump uh, ever increasing uh, tariffs or at least threatening more tariffs. And the human cost, um, you know, the assumption is that we are uh, uh, hurting the Chinese, but in fact, we are we're simultaneously hurting ourselves, you know, um, so whole industries, specifically agriculture, um, but uh, many others uh, are suffering uh, and can are in threat to suffer more uh, due to these things. And I think what's to, to answer your question in a roundabout way, like how do we get out of the trap, you know, of thinking that way? I think, you know, empathy is about uh, uh, being able to relate to one another. And so if we are able to paint the picture that, you know, sanctions, as an example, uh, hurts people in the same way that tariffs hurt you. I think that might be a good bridge, uh, you know, to help the American people understand that, you know, that there's real human costs to these types of decisions in foreign policy. 
uh, and, uh, you know, just domestically here. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And I would uh, I would add to that one of the things that I find alarming about the Trump administration's resort to uh, sanctions is that uh, or sorry, to uh, to tariffs. Um, you know, even though I'm a free trader, I mean, I, I think that there are tariffs have been used in different ways throughout American history. I mean, sometimes it was used as a way to raise revenues for the state in lieu of taxes, which you know you can have a reasonable debate about. But one of the things that, that I think is different and concerning about the way the Trump administration has re resorted to tariffs is that he's done so as part of a larger culture war, where he's made the argument for tariffs uh, not simply as an instrument to get China to do this or that, but really it's grounded in a, in a more uh, populist narrative where uh, tariffs are a good thing because they uh, close our economy off to the world. They they protect the American worker. They um, kind of keep out products or or influence from other people in other country. Mm -hmm. And so, I while I definitely agree that it's worth pointing out the the human cost of these tariffs, I think also the ideology and the the philosophy and the assumptions um, that legitimate the use of tariffs needs to be attacked as well. Absolutely, and and we we tried and we we've done a few episodes on tariffs in general, and neither of us are uh, particularly uh, good um, or you know favorable to them at all. Uh, and uh, I, I definitely agree with you. I think that that you know those myths need to be dispelled because, quite frankly, the ideology that tariffs are a good thing, you know, for the American people is just you know at at, at best misguided, at worst just you know ignorant, um, ignorant to the realities that is. So. We're over an hour. We don't want to keep you all night, but you know, before before we send this thing home, I would love to hear your take on. I guess there's two major things. Something that we've been, or a reoccurring theme that we've been talking about over the past couple of weeks has been obviously Trump's um, claim that we're moving, claim that we're we're leaving Syria, um, and since then, there's been a lot of crazy stuff that's going been going on. Um, there seems to be a lot of flip flopping, to the point where you know even someone like myself who, who fall who's been following the Syrian war for some time is just kind of like I don't really know what's going on right now it seems like there's a lot of um, miscommunications that are going on and um, to add that yesterday we had Baghdadi who is the who, who was the commander of Isis um, allegedly killed I don't I don't you know the guy has been allegedly killed many times in the past couple of years but this time, it definitely seems like he has kicked the bucket, um, at least because there's been multiple countries who have been confirming his death. So, you know, I'd love to hear your, your take on Trump's move um, to leave Syria. Um, if you know anything in. about that, <laughs> if, if you know if or go back into Syria, wherever, whatever, whatever is going on right now. And, you know, maybe some insight on the whole Baghdadi thing, which you know the administration is uh, very excited to to announce. Yeah, well, well look, I, I think any commentary about or criticism or or whatnot about uh, Trump's policy on Syria, I think it's important to just keep in mind that at the end of the day, in these conflicts, um, the reason why they're turning one way or the other is not fundamentally because of. Uh, anything we do or don't do. I mean, to me, the biggest uh, blunder that we've seen in the Syria conflict is really on the uh, Syrian people themselves. I think I think the biggest, the single biggest uh, strategic mistake in this conflict was the decision by the Syrian opposition to Assad to turn a, a nonviolent uprising into a violent one, uh, which uh, I think is at the root of why this conflict spiraled into what it did. And I think had the uh, Syrian and in fact, I actually met with uh, uh, someone from the Syrian Kurdish opposition, and we, we had this conversation that if they had maintained nonviolent discipline and tried to undermine the regime in different ways, uh, that the conflict would have been uh, turned out a lot better in any number of ways. And so, you know, even if Trump's withdrawal from Syria does lead to problematic consequences and instability, and I think it will. Um, uh, I don't think it would be fair to pin the blame for what's happening in Syria fundamentally oh, yeah, on for the U.S. I, 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 ab absolutely, and I think you know some a big part of that blame has to do with the government, like for, from from the U.S. funding these these rebels when things did get violent. Yeah, it, it's astonishing to me that the 
you know, every every time that we have a foreign policy conflict or we have a, an issue with a certain regime, um, I've I've never quite understood why it's the the violent insurgents or the violent people in opposition who seem to command a certain degree of uh, respect or deference in Washington compared to those who prefer uh, nonviolent or political means to undermining the these regimes. Um, I mean, even when these regimes look to be strong, there are always people in exile. There are always uh, people out there who are agitating in different ways. And, and I think that we could get a higher, a greater return on our dollar by supporting those who are working nonviolently rather than uh, uh, violently. Um, you know, I suppose that uh, that relates to the other question you posed about the Baghdadi uh, assassination in particular. I mean, uh, look, I, I'm obviously assuming that he's dead and that it looks like he is. I mean, this is obviously a, probably a positive development. But the idea that we're going to solve our problem with uh, any adversarial movement uh, by, by killing this leader or that leader, I think, is... Uh, totally misguided. And, and here, I, I, I also think it's worth criticizing the Obama administration for the way they handled uh, the killing of Osama bin Laden. I mean, certainly it was a strategic victory at some level uh, for the U.S. But um, th this conflict with, with radical Islam never should have been about bin Laden or even al-Qaeda. It should have really been about the question of how this mass movement throughout the Islamic world has come to the fore. Why, why are figures like Osama bin Laden emerging in the first place? And until we really figure out how to sort of uh, drain the swamp of these ideologies, uh, killing this leader or that leader is, is uh, not going to get to the root of the problem. I'd agree with that characterization. I think that, you know, um, we're, what we're doing is is treating the symptoms and not necessarily curing the disease, uh, you know, by, by taking out um, this leader or that leader, as you say. Um, and and what, what I'd like to get a, a little bit more color from you from is, is uh, specifically on Syria, uh, is that, you know, Trump's initial decision to pull out of, of Syria, you know, didn't sit well with me for a number of reasons. But, you know, it could be characterized as as moving more towards, you know, a pacifist movement. You know, um, we're, we're pulling out, right? We're not using aggression anymore. But, you know, then we, we see these developments coming up whereby we're now diverting those U.S. forces from Syria to other areas in the Middle East, you know, countries like Saudi Arabia, things like that, uh, which is, it, it seems a counter to the idea. And now very recently, we are moving tanks and, and other armored vehicles back into Syria. Um, so my criticism of, of Trump's foreign policy there in in, in Syria is, is, is a lack of, of um, kind of cohesion um, and uh, uh almost like a, a lack of foresight. Uh, I, th I thought that the operation to pull out of Syria, you know, was morally necessary uh, in, in a certain respect, but that it should have been taken out, um, undertaken in a, in a way with um, consideration to the, you know, the operational effect of it. Uh, and, you know, going back and, and putting more tanks in the, in the in the country just seems like a, seems like it threw away, you know, the risks and the dangers that, you know, they put a lot of the people in the region uh, in. And I'm wondering, you know, how, how does that square away with, um, you know, uh, your, your take on, on, you know, realism and, and or, or beyond? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I think that the, uh, the way the Syria withdrawal was handled was misguided on any number of levels. Uh, to me, there are two things that are particularly troubling about it. I think one is that at least based on the reporting that I've seen so far, I actually don't really understand how this decision was even reached. I mean, from what I've gathered, there wasn't a normal interagency process. It seems like major uh, senior figures in the administration were left in the dark. I, it looks to me like something happened between Trump and Erdogan, which we don't quite know yet, um, which led to this uh, string of events. And so I think that there is... Um, there are serious questions here about the thought process, if any, behind what happened. But the other is the uh, consequences for our relationship with the Kurds. And I think that if we're going to, at a practical matter, um, begin to uh, withdraw U.S. forces from some of these areas and, and have a greater foreign policy of restraint, it's going to be very hard to do that without solid alliances and relationships between uh, with countries or movements that are really uh, at the front lines of these conflicts. Um, I, I view the Kurds as being a, a, a very sympathetic group of people. I think they've developed a good uh, 
uh, working relationship with U.S. forces and civilians over the last uh, decade. And of all the groups in the world to betray or get on the wrong foot with, um, I don't see why it has to be the Kurds. I'd agree with that. Um... Maybe, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of running uh, long here. I, I wanted to switch this up a little bit and just ask, I guess, a fun question and then we can, you know, wrap and, and you can plug some of your stuff. But uh, let's talk about the 2020 Democratic hopefuls. I know we touched on it a little bit there, um, but what's your take here? You know, any anyone standing out to you? Like, who do you think has a, the best opportunity to win the nomination at the very least? Well, I, I think that probably it's going to be one of uh, Biden, Warren, and Sanders. I mean, if you, I, I've been struck by the extent to which the the media is intent on basically writing off uh, Biden and Sanders, but they're both very much in the hunt. My my theory on this, which I can't totally prove, is that uh, those who are in the elite media um, are are predominantly not the kind of people who are sympathetic to Biden or Sanders and. Whereas they do resonate at, at different in different ways with candidates like um, uh, Warren and Buttigieg and uh, Kamala Harris and others, so I think a lot of the picture we're getting from mainstream reporting is probably uh, overstated. But I think that the the big observation that I'm at least making is that whoever uh, the Democratic nominee is that emerges, it, it's becoming abundantly clear to me from the way the debate is unfolding that there is a pretty profound shift that's happening in the Democratic Party on economics in particular. Um, and it, you know, I would, I would argue that we now have two of the three main front runners who are, in one case, calling explicitly for socialism, and the other case, uh, you know, advocating for it without, without calling it, um, calling it that. And now even Biden, who I've always thought of as being a mainstream establishment Democrat, I mean, he's now staking out policies on economics that would have been uh, consider, considered quite extreme even four years ago. Right. Um, so I, I think that we're, uh, whoever the nominee is, I think we're going to have a fundamental uh, debate about the legitimacy of a, a market-based capitalist economy going into the general election. Do you think any of them have any chance of uh, unseating Trump? Uh, that is, if he survives an impeachment. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I I think it's an open question whether or not uh, Trump will be the nominee. Not only because of uh, the impeachment scandal, but also the um, for for reasons I don't completely understand. Republicans haven't really acknowledged or come to terms with just how badly Trump is polling. Um, and if, if Trump's numbers continue to be where they are, or they even continue to dip a little bit more, um, and he does somehow get the Republican nomination, we could really see the kind of landslide election that we haven't had uh, in a long time. So I think that if come March or April or something, if, if Trump's numbers continue to be where they are, um, he'll have to make a, his own decision on whether or not he wants to keep going or bow out of the race um, and deal with his legal issues and other things that he's dealing with. But I think that if uh, if Trump does, in fact, become the Republican nomination, uh, I don't see any candidate on the Democratic side, maybe with the possible exception of Kamala Harris, uh, who, who would not beat Trump in a general. That's interesting. Who, who would not beat Trump in a general? I, in other words, I, I think all of them would beat Trump uh, with the possible exception of Kamala Harris. Yeah. Really? That's the first time, that's the first time, that's the first, that's, that's an interesting take because a lot of the, I guess a lot of the people I've been reading, I've been, I've been listening to have had the op, the opposite take that I haven't really looked at Trump's poll numbers and I'll be completely honest. Um, but mo a lot of the publications I've, I've seen and granted, I, they're definitely more right leaning publications have been saying that any Democrat that's been running is going to be beat in a landslide by Trump. So I feel like there's a big, I mean, that's interesting because I know that you're not, you're not a never Trumper. So I'm interested. It means a lot more to you than me. Yeah. Saying it means a lot more to me than if it was just an anti-Trumper. Yeah, like saying me. That. <laughs> like Danny, if Danny was saying that. Yeah. Well, I've been struck and I think both, this is true, uh, uh, ironically enough of both, um, Trump supporters and his critics that they've, I think had a tendency to severely overestimate, uh, Trump's popularity and his political prowess. Um, 
I think there's very much this notion that Trump is a Teflon president or candidate, that um, he's not weakened by his blunders. Uh, it, it's simply not true. I mean, for, for one thing, if you look at his um, uh, election victory in 2016, I would argue that this was a year after eight years of Obama that in many ways structurally uh, favored any generic Republican candidate. Um, add to that the fact that he was up against uh, one of the most pop uh, unpopular Democratic candidates. Uh, add to the fact that how many lucky flukes, including the Comey announcement, broke in his favor. And despite all that, he, he barely eked it out by like a 10,000 vote margin or something. In, what are you in talking Michigan. about? It was, the, it was the biggest election ever. It was yeah. the biggest win ever. <laughs> no, that's right. And then when you look at the Trump's <laughs> approval ratings, uh, he never crossed 50 percent, which uh, you, you, if you think about, if you situate that in the context of how good the economy has been, and you think about how high the approval ratings of any other recent president would have been, um, this is a very weak uh, president, and, and it's going to be in a in a in an election that inevitably is going to be in large part a referendum on the incumbent. I'm hard pressed to see, unless the Democrats really just uh, screw it up uh, somehow. Uh, how Trump's going to be able to build on the coalition that he had in 2016. <laughs> it's totally possible that they that they fuck it up. <laughs> well, I think I think what's going on and, and I'll and I'll just add one thing before before we wrap this up. So I think what's going on with Trump is that you I feel like the strat I was at CPAC last year and and um I, the direction that they were going in was uniting the conservative base in this this grand battle of social versus socialism and i think the hole that the democrats have put themselves in and you know you mentioned this before even joe biden is um spouting a lot of very left-wing economic policies and i think they have a huge risk no matter who the nominee is is um being seen as just radical leftist that or or so even socialist which is I think is still a dirty word to a lot of people in the U.S. So I think that's a huge risk the Democrats are facing right now. And when it comes to voting for Trump, um, regardless of what the popularity is versus voting for someone who could flip everything on his head and start implementing socialist policies, I think a lot of Americans might be really be very concerned about that. But then again, what do I know? During the last election, I would have bet a million dollars that Trump would have lost so I, I am in no position to make any type of predictions or, or have been looking um, a lot at even the polling numbers with Trump. It's not something that we typically talk about that much on this podcast, <laughs> to be completely honest. Yeah. But um, it's an interesting take from you because, um, you know, you're, you're not a leftist. So um, or not like a, you know, a not a, a you know, I don't think that you're a Democrat, but, <laughs> <He's> a, <laughs> but I, I was an interesting take. It's an interesting take, I will say. Yeah, I, well, look, I'll just say one more point here, and I, I say this uh, regrettably, but if the if the Republican Party thinks that they they can make this election a referendum on uh, socialism, if they try to pigeonhole whatever Democratic candidate is and being a socialist, and that that'll be enough to win. Um, I think they're mistaken. And, I, and again, I say this regrettably, but if you look at the extent to which uh, Americans are concerned about income inequality, um, you look at the tolerance that we now have of uh, very high deficits. You look at the fact that there is uh, virtually no major political party or candidate talking seriously about entitlement reform or um, rolling back uh, significant government programs. Uh, I would argue, in some ways, we're already on the road to socialism. And if you, if if we in this moment really have a national referendum uh, on whether or not the American people want more progressive taxation or less, whether they want more government or less. Um, I, I fear that that uh, uh, debate could very well break uh, uh, in a socialist direction. And, and in many ways, the things that have made the U.S. exceptional, our dedication to free markets and whatnot, uh, there's nothing inevitable about that. And this could be the year where we begin to move toward a more European uh, direction. Well, you heard it here on Bro History. Pratik, thank you so much for taking your time out of your day to, to come and chat with us about 
way too many things. Uh, I want to yeah, give you an opportunity. Is... Uh, yeah, sorry, Henry. I didn't mean to oh yeah, I'm just gonna add. This is this has been great, and I appreciate you sticking with us for the full hour and a half. No, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. And um, yeah, I guess you can find me in uh, on Twitter or uh, my website is simply my name, Um But uh, yeah, no, I'm I'm really grateful uh, for the conversation, and uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, we need to have you on again. This this has been great. Um, we'll we'll definitely uh, keep track of your articles and, and let us know whenever you're releasing something and you want to uh, you want to come on the you show want and talk to, about uh, it. Yeah, plug because uh, this has been great. Really, the per- you brought some great perspectives and um, just really enjoyed this conversation. I think everyone's gonna get a lot out of it. Great, thank you.